Welcome to Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership, the weekly podcast that features the very best in career development in the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Patton McDowell, and committed to bringing you ideas and resources that will help you build your professional development plan. Thanks for listening. If you're a current nonprofit leader or you hope to be one, you're in the right place. I'm glad to bring you these weekly conversations with nonprofit leaders who are on the cutting edge of our sector. And if you would, do me a favor, share this episode with one other person so we can continue to build a global community focused on nonprofit leadership. And the episode you're going to want to share is my conversation today with Charles Thomas, who brings fantastic experience both as an executive director and now as the program director for the Knight Foundation. Now, Charles has led over $25 million in investments from the Knight Foundation in this region. But perhaps more important to this conversation is that he genuinely understands the role of nonprofit leadership and all of the challenges and opportunities that are inherent to the role and certainly some of the things you're likely thinking about right now. And Charles and I dive into the lessons he learned from his days at the Light Factory in Queen City Ford and how those experiences now affect his work with Knight Foundation grantees. Now, Charles is also a very talented professional photographer, and he partnered with Valeda Fullwood to create a wonderful book called Giving Back, a tribute to generations of African-American philanthropists. Certainly an appropriate topic to discuss as we celebrate Black Philanthropy Month right now. And Charles talks about that and how that project was important to him. And by the way, you can also check out Valeda's appearance on our podcast. It was episode number 52 as we further explore evidence of the wonderful philanthropy in the African-American community. Don't forget the show notes. This is episode number 118. Just go to the podcast or the news page at patmcdowell.com, and you'll find all of the resources Charles and I discuss, as well as more information on him and the great work he's doing through the Knight Foundation. This episode is sponsored by PMA's unique mastermind program. So while you're on our website, check it out. Find out if it might be a good fit for you as you ponder the next step on your leadership journey. Of course, while you're on the website, connect with us. Get on our email list so you do not miss out on any of these weekly episodes and as well as special editions of the podcast and other resource material. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation now with Charles Thomas. Charles, thank you for joining me on the path. Thanks for having me, Patton. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm excited about this conversation. Uh, You bring wisdom from several perspectives. One, you're representing a wonderfully generous national foundation and the Knight Foundation, but you've also been in the trenches. You and I have had great conversations in the past. You have been a nonprofit executive director, so you know what our listeners are dealing with, and I'm glad to combine the wisdom you have from both of those perspectives. We'll get into that. We'll unpack that. But let me ask you this first question. Charles, you've had a lot of cool accomplishments, but what are you most proud of as you think about your career so far in philanthropy? Oh, um, that's a really good question. Um, I've been very blessed um, in this role at Knight Foundation since uh, 2016, and we've done quite a bit of good work in Charlotte. So uh, there are two things that come to mind. One, um, about two, three years ago, we announced a $10 million investment in the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library to build the new main library in Center City of Charlotte. Uh, and it's to support the new main library being a tech forward commons to open to all, but really leaning into the 21st century to make sure that the library is able to reach patrons where they are, um, which a lot of patrons now are on their phone. So we made a $10 million pledge and investment um, into uh, the new main library branch. And we are the largest um, private investor. And this grant is the largest grant, single grant that Knight Foundation has done in Charlotte. So that's one of my proudest um, grants and partnerships with Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. And then um, secondly, which we can talk more about is I'm just proud of the work I do every day in the historic West End, which is right outside of center city of Charlotte. Um, historically African-American neighborhood that's gone through rapid change. We have um, made over uh, six and a half million dollars in investments uh, since 2015 to support residents being a part of the development of their neighborhood. And so 
that's the day-to-day -day work I'm passionate about. I love it. And um, I just feel very honored to be in this role and to be a charlatan. That's fantastic. And two great examples of your work and the work, of course, of the Knight Foundation. And we'll unpack that more because I know that represents some things that you have explored. And frankly, I'm sure other Knight communities around the country perhaps benefit from your work here in Charlotte. And I'm sure there's a collaboration we can talk about and lessons maybe what you and I know here in this community, but certainly apply elsewhere in the country. Um, Charles, I've asked a lot of my guests, or in fact, just about everyone, how do you stay organized in this, particularly this new hybrid world we're both trying to figure out? I'm curious if you have figured out anything that might uh, benefit our listeners. I think my assistant wouldn't say that I've been staying organized. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I have an assistant and it's a very wonderful thing to have someone who can assist with calendar and work. Um, she makes fun of me because I have, if you were to look at my desk right now, all these these tabs, these notepads. Um, but ultimately, the, what I try to teach my, my sons, it's about writing it down. You have all these ideas, all these thoughts. The, the more you can get it out on paper and organize it by day, um, by priority. Uh, so that's a key component of what I do. And, and I've got you know the notepads to prove it. And then I use my phone very strategically for calendar um, uh, meetings, but also for reminders. Um, so right. I really... Um, leverage the reminder feature um, on my phone, um, and um, and I just use my technology to keep me organized. Like even from taking my notes and being able to find a conversation I had a year ago, two years ago, um, I can quickly do that and kind of get up to speed quickly in a particular conversation. So those are a few few ways I do it. I think it's basic, but a surprise that people don't write. A lot of people try to hold things in their heads and that's just, <laughs> it's just not work. That's a recipe for disaster. Are, are you a daily ritual guy, a weekly ritual guy, or have you found anything in particular that helps you sort out the list, so to speak? I might make a list of the things that need to get accomplished for the week and then, you know, go at it. And sometimes I make daily pieces. And then I do do, um, I've not been as strong, I think this year, 2021 has been a strange year for some reason. But I usually start the year with a big, big vision of what I'm seeking to accomplish um, personally in my life and then professionally and then with family. Uh, and then I go back to those. Sometimes it can be every day, depending on what the, what the vision is, or it can be quarterly just to make sure I'm making progress on those things most important. Right. Uh, because it really is, you know, we get in our day to day and I find myself, um, you know, I was just thinking about um, it's almost the end of the summer and I had a goal for all of us to to, to, to learn swimming, to be, you know, better swimmers this summer. And nice. it's almost the end of the summer. And, and I realized I did not write it down in a place where I could see it. It's like buried somewhere in some thought that I had earlier in this year, but it's important that the important things are, you can see them on a regular basis. Otherwise they just, it's out of sight, out of mind. Love that. Great advice. And again, we can get consumed by our daily routines and lose sight maybe of the bigger picture. And that visioning exercise you do is one I want to keep track of. Uh, Charles, before we get into more of the great work you're doing through the Knight Foundation, I want to go back to your journey as a nonprofit executive director. Okay. In fact, you led two wonderful organizations, the Light Factory and Queen City Ford. Why'd you get into nonprofit work in the first place? Let me start with that. Man, that's a really good question. Um, I came out of school, econ major worked corporate um, for a, a short period of time and decided to uh, leave corporate to live a life of purpose um, and happiness. And I then started a photography business. So I was working for myself. Um, but uh, I came into the light factory through this, this wonderful element to my photography business, which was teaching young people photography, teaching K, K through five kindergartners. And you imagine wow. teaching kindergartners about photography and the science of, of light. And the Light Factory Museum hired me, um, recognizing what I was doing kind of on my own in the classroom, um, rec uh, hired me to be their education director. Uh, and to me, once I got into that role, and this eventually led to Queen City Forward, I found um, working a nonprofit was a great way to marry my interests, my passion around making money um, and having impact. While there, I read a book by um, Muhammad Yunus, an economist uh, who started the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. And I learned this new term called social entrepreneurship. 
Right. And I realized that there was a whole industry around, you know, finding innovative ideas, um, monetizing those ideas and doing it in a way that serves, you know, people, planet and profit. Um, and so that's what really got me into social entrepreneurship, which led to um, being hired to be the first executive director for Queen City Forward and to focus on accelerating uh, socially conscious entrepreneurs in our community to go after some of our most challenging issues and to do it in a way that's scalable and sustainable. So both of them were great, great jobs. And I learned quite a bit about the nonprofit sector. What surprised you in that role? Because clearly you brought a passion for the cause and impact on those you serve. But once you got in the big chair, so to speak, as a nonprofit executive director, anything jump out at you as you reflect on that experience? Yeah, there, there were as, as a nonprofit executive director, a couple of things. Um, one is letting go of the previous role. Yeah. Um, I've been, um, you know, going from working for myself to then working at the Light Factory as the education director, where at first, that first year, I was going out and teaching kids photography. Yep. And then the second year, I was like, wait a minute, what if I were to find five other people to do what I'm doing, I could impact more kids. And so same thing at Queen City Forward, I went from, you know, being someone that can design photography programs to where I was designing entrepreneurship programs. But then I realized I was like, wait, 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 I don't think that's my job anymore. I think I'm supposed to go, you know, raise money, be the face of the organization, work on strategy. So surprisingly, it's the hardest part. It's lonely, but sometimes there's a certain kind of um, mourning or letting go that has to occur of that previous role. And really finding a way to lean into, you know, that stretch goal, so those, those stretch things that you have to do. And, it, you know, and I don't know why it, was, it came to me as a surprise, but money is a big thing, you know, is a, is, can be an elusive thing in a nonprofit. Yeah. Uh, and there's not, a, it feels like there's not an abundance of it. Um, and so realizing and understanding what it takes to, as an executive director, to really stay focused on the money, on fundraising, fundraising. Um, when I was really more interested in, you know, working with the entrepreneurs, designing, you know, calling the mentors, calling the, uh, the speakers to do an event versus raising the money for the event. Um, right. So, so th those were some surprises for me um, and some learning edges for me. You think a lot of our nonprofit colleagues and friends, Charles, uh, struggle with that. They, they start in the program side, you know, impacting literally the constituents that they serve. But when you move into leadership, I thought you made a very interesting point there. You had to disassociate in some ways from that programmatic area that you first got involved. Is that something you see now as a funder? And is that a challenge? I think it can be, particularly new nonprofits and uh, new folks who are socially conscious trying to solve a community issue. They're so caught up in the possibility of doing good and having an impact um, that they don't think about the, the financials of their their business. And yeah. a lot of people don't think of nonprofits as businesses, and they are. <laughs> They're just incorporated um, under a different tax status, which gives them some business advantages yes, um, right. that if they understand that, they can leverage. And those who do, do. And I would say that it's not even just a nonprofit issue. It's anyone that is excited about, even artists, they're excited about making their art, but they're not excited about selling their art or doing the business of it. Right. So um, it's something that um, I, um, I'm thankful because I've always enjoyed this idea of, of making money. Um, but it, I, I get so um, saddened when I meet people who are extremely talented, whether it's, you know, their idea for serving the community is, is a really strong idea and they have a great work ethic, but they don't they run away from the money piece. And it's yeah. usually because there's a bad um, association of what money means, that money is bad. Um, it, uh, this, you know, the money is evil. Um, when I see it as just the tool for scaling impact. And when I started having that as my mindset that, Hey, you know, with this tool, this thing called money, I can have make more of a difference. Then it I was able to flip it from it being that money is bad or, I'm having to beg for money that I've really began to go, I'm really, you know, creating value and, and supporting my community in a bigger way. Cause I'm, I'm thinking about, um, it's really thinking about it in a higher way and not getting stuck on, you know, the business side and really, and understanding that the business side allows me to scale. Um, so I think that's critical for nonprofit leaders to understand. I think a lot of times 
there's just there's continues even at the executive director level a shyness around the the business side of of managing a nonprofit. And I'm not saying all executive directors of nonprofits. I'm just saying right, folks right. folks get into it for the social cause, and when they're not able to touch the cause in a direct way like they did, you know, when they originally started, then sometimes they feel like they've sold out or what is this really about when it's about the money? And if you've built an organization that is a company that's organized well, then the money is just a channel for, for scaling impact. You can also go awry. You can get too focused on the money. Right. Um, so that is definitely a, 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 a factor, can be a factor of nonprofit leaders as well as for-profit. Um, but I, it's always about impact at the end of the day. Do we have the impact? Are we doing what we say we're about? Um, and can we, um, can we show and measure that impact? I love the way you've reframed it because I think a lot of our colleagues in the nonprofit sector, you're right, they're uncomfortable with the fundraising side. Perhaps the connotations you, as you articulate around money make it uncomfortable, but but you reframed it, didn't you? Literally, Charles, in terms of this is an opportunity for investment in the impact I'm trying to achieve. And I, yeah. I guess, is that how you counsel people now when they say, Charles, I love what I'm doing, but I don't want to fundraise? You You literally kind of reframe that conversation, don't you? I do. And I'm like, well, do you want to, do you want to do what you're doing long term? Do you want to be in business long or do you want to have solved this problem or have this impact in a long way? Long way? I'm just like, uh, then it's important to think about it um, as something that's fuel for your social good and your social impact um, and not getting too caught up. And, you know, again, sometimes you got to be careful where money comes from and who you accept money from. Um, I think that's great. But if I've also met people that are so moralistic about it, that it blocks their ability to, to, to grow um, into yeah. their work. Um, and so the once I think it's understood that um, we're providing value as nonprofit leaders. Um, and then really for me, I mean, this is something I learned from you, you know, once I flipped it and I, and I began to see that, well, I mean, before I flipped it, I realized <laughs> that I had, I had no where, where to go, but, um, but, uh, uh, to raise money because we were running out of money. And so right. if I didn't, if I didn't raise money, I was not going to be able to feed my family. And I think it's important. Um, I think it's a, an art of war quote, quote about burning the bridge behind you. Um, that is important to, to forge ahead. Um, and once I kind of leaned into that, this is what I'm supposed to do in this role. Then, you know, I went to folks like yourself and I asked, you know, experts in the field of fundraising. I said, how do you do it? And that's where I learned about it, relationships and fostering partnerships with funders, understanding their interests and seeing how they align to my interests um, and recognizing that funders, um, uh, that, um, that that's a critical component to building any relationship is just listening and understanding everybody's interests and that it, and don't take it for granted that they, just cause you're, I think when uh, they're, even when I took this role, I think there's this idea that when, because you're nonprofit, someone's going to give you money. Yeah. And it's just, it's a lot more, um, it's, it's a lot deeper than that. And just because you're a foundation, you're going to give them money. And it's just a lot deeper and strategic than that. And so um, it's critical to, in all cases, to take time to get to know people and understand that getting to know people takes time. So you may not get the money in the first request. And I really started building a structure around meeting with certain people once, twice a year, whether they gave money or not, just in terms of building relationship building social capital and, um, and helping them stay aware as to what I'm doing so that they may tell me about, if not them, who else may align to my work, yep. get them to start thinking about me, you know, I'm top of mind. And so that was how, once I kind of flipped it into a game, understood that I'm bringing value. Well, you've been a great relationship builder throughout your career. And I'm eager now to dive into how you brought that, that skill and experience to the Knight Foundation and your role there. For those listeners who may not be familiar with the Knight Foundation, let's start with that, Charles. Talk about what is the Knight Foundation, uh, you know, and how is it focused on helping, of course, communities all across the country? Uh, Knight Foundation, the, the full name is John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. We were started by John S. and James L. Knight, who were both um, brothers and newspaper men. Uh, they owned newspapers across uh, the country and at one point had the, one of the largest newspaper companies in the country. Uh, their um, newspaper uh, uh, were in newspapers were in 26 cities, and so when um, they passed away, 
and the foundation was formed, uh, our mission is built upon um, fostering more informed and engaged communities. So very much journalistic and um, just as our founders were. Uh, and so we invest in journalism, arts, and in the night cities where, um, in the night communities where night newspapers were located. And we're based out of Miami. I'm the Charlotte program director. Um, and so in eight of the 26 cities, there's a director such as myself who works in the city's program or community's program. And we have an opportunity to design our a strategy for how to foster more informed and engaged communities. And our strategy in Charlotte is focused in a neighborhood uh, geographically outside of downtown Charlotte um, called the Historic West End, historically um, African-American community uh, that is currently going through rapid change. Um, prior to that was um, a community that was experiencing, you know, back in its day was a really, you know, um, vibrant community that underwent some some challenges and now it's seeing a resurgence um you know yet it's fraught with the challenges of balancing growth and making sure that historic and native people that were there um, benefit from um, the development that's fantastic and uh, uh, making a note here that we will certainly link in the show notes uh, more about the knight foundation and the work you're here doing here in charlotte I guess tying back to your earlier comments about now you've been on the side of the fence to raise money. Now yeah. you're providing funds. How do you look at organizations that are eligible, of course, in terms of their fundraising capacity or, or maybe speak to some of those key elements you're looking for when someone approaches you for Knight Foundation funding? What are the keys to a successful application? Yeah. So number one, um, alignment to Knight's interests. So, um, for the work that I do, alignment to supporting the historic West, West End or alignment to our national program in the arts or journalism. So uh, that's number one to see if there's alignment. If there's not alignment, then we have more of a conversation around if there are other ways we can help and other, inf other information that we can provide outside of funding. And then once there's alignment, then it's about the idea. Uh, it's about the, you know, the impact that the potential impact of the idea that's being put on the table or the potential impact of the leader or the organization. Then it's about is that idea, um, can they implement and pull off that idea in a way that they're describing? And then the one of the final pieces is, um, is it um, sustainable? Uh, can this occur in a way that's repeatable or is this a one time deal? It doesn't have to always meet the sustainability criteria. Um, and so, so those are, you know, we first look for strategic alignment and then we look for the impact, um, and make sure and making sure that the, there's the right person, individual leader or team to bring that impact forward. And, um, and then to look for those ideas that we go, whoa, this is going to be something that's going to have impact today and many years to come. Uh, and so those are a few of the ways, um, lenses that we use to, to evaluate, um, particular opportunities. Love that. And you won't be surprised by this question, a podcast on nonprofit leadership. Glad to hear you're looking for evidence of that leadership. Is there any specific characteristics you found with the successful leaders you are evaluating? If I'm listening, I'm thinking, all right, what is Charles going to be looking for in me as a nonprofit leader? Uh, you know, it's still like you, you talk about being on the other side of the table. So I'm still looking for social entrepreneurs, looking for someone that has quite a bit of hustle uh, that is going to do it no matter what, that is a, that is a big win. Like, you know, it's like the money, you know, everyone deserves money for the work that they do um, in community, but some of our key grantees, I mean, I'm looking, I'm imagine them right now in my face. Gonna, <laughs> right. They were doing the work before they will do the work, you know, with night money, they'll do the work without night money afterwards. Yeah. So um, something I didn't mention in terms of how we evaluate, it's like, is there momentum around the idea? Or is this just something that's sitting out there by itself? You know, is there other momentum to make sure that this is going to give the returns, the impact returns that we're all wanting? And so you look for an entrepreneur similar to, you know, maybe a, um, we consider ourselves social investors, but you're looking for a team and an individual that believes in the idea, is dedicated to the idea. Sometimes you're wanting them to quit their job to do the idea. Um, and um, uh, and then they're um, making, what do you call them? Um, they're taking calculated risk. So they're willing to take risk, but they're calculated strategic risk. You don't, you know, 
you, you don't want someone that's just, you know, too, too conservative. And then you don't want someone that's so, you know, um, jumps at everything that they're all over the place. They're taking really interesting calculated risk. And then I think another piece that I think I will add is an opportunity to learn from someone who a grantee who has a different perspective. Um, that's not like a, that's kind of like one of those bonus pieces, but um, in the West End, the grantees that we find, you know, um, they are always pleasantly surprised by how much they know about their neighborhood, things that Charlotte, the rest of Charlotte doesn't know about that they know about. And that it's almost like that, um, again, another investment opportunity of being the first in on something that's going to be big. Right. Um, so being able to go in on something you knew, unique, um, that's going to have impact that you only will find for someone who is right there working on the ground in their neighborhood and only a resident would know. So we have a big, um, I haven't mentioned it before either, a lot of our work when you see, particularly in our communities work or, um, that I on is very much around resident-centered work. So um, I'm excited that we have a number of grantees that actually live in the neighborhood that they're serving. That's fantastic. In fact, we'll talk about that because, as you know, in the larger philanthropic community, there are questions sometimes about funding that comes from outside. It doesn't utilize information from the residents themselves. And it sounds like Mm -hmm. you're sensitive to that, funding that. Um, And it sounds like you also look for that kind of collaborative spirit. Is that fair to say or or you want a a spirit of education? Um, But I wanted to unpack that even further. What did you mean by that point? Um, well, really a spirit of learning. So it's, it's kind of partnering with a, um, a, a leader that takes me to places in the community or exposes opportunities in the community that you, that, a, an outside funder wouldn't see. Gotcha. Um, so you want someone with the inside knowledge, um, and then collaboration. Absolutely. Collaboration is, um, is, is such a leverage opportunity that when folks are co- collaborating, we, we have quite a bit. Um, we not only we also invest in um, smart cities work, so innovative, not innovative per se, but um, supporting cities as they look at leveraging technology to be more um, engaged, to help residents be more engaged with cities. Um, and what we have in Charlotte is we have a really strong portfolio of technology, um, technology grantees um, and resident grantees that are working to, you know, build like augmented reality apps or virtual reality experiences so that residents can, you know, plan out their neighborhood. So for the 20, like our conference, the 2040 plan. Um, so just get our young people gamifying a walk in a park, you know? So um, those are really interesting initiatives where we're seeing some leverage around collaboration, but collaboration is key. That's fantastic. Clearly COVID-19 affected everything for everybody. I'm sure it affected some of the grant making operations of the Knight Foundation. I wonder, as you think back to the last year and a half or so, are there significant changes that happened as to how you and the Knight Foundation approach grant making or changes going forward as a result? Yeah, it it definitely had an impact um, on our, you know, of course, on our grantees for sure. And so early on, it was about flexibility. We um, created ways to be more flexible with our grantees. Um, then it became about emergency relief, um, so providing, being a part of a collaborative funding effort to, to make sure the dollars were there for those um, in, most impacted by um, the, the pandemic um, and the economic crisis that came out of it. And then we moved into, our grant making moved into looking for how um, organizations are pivoting for this in this new normal. So this is innovation. And where companies, uh, nonprofits were using um, technology to engage uh, new audiences or then to keep one stay in business, but to right. engage audiences. And what they discovered is um, you're, they're engaging more or a wider variety of audiences. Of course, we also ran into the challenge around the digital divide. So um, for us, it, it, it affirmed some things that my CEO was um, who, you know, is very much a future oriented um, where, you know, seeing what, how disruptive technology has been to journalism, understanding that technology is the new, um, it's kind of the, literally the new world and where people are shopping, buying is where they're at. Yep. So, um, you know, COVID really just forced all of us 
you know, to this day, here we are on Zoom, to move away from meeting in person to using technology to be in communication. Uh, and so our grant making began to look for more of those opportunities for with um, in, in creating um, funding and incentives and funding um, opportunities for um, for our organizations, for our grantees, for, for those that we think are critical to fostering informed and engaged communities to really think about how they might go digital and how they can leverage digital to you know, take their work you know, to the next level, such as you know, the, the work we do at the library. Yeah, I love that example. In fact, I was gonna ask you, the library certainly represents that philosophically as an investment for the Knight Foundation. And before we get into some of the other complexities that you know better than anyone, let me ask you a couple of philosophic questions about your grant making. Um, what was and maybe is going forward your approach to just operating grants? In other words, there's, as you know, a lot of nonprofit leaders are like, do I have to create this highly specialized, new, shiny program for a foundation to want to fund me? Um, what do you say to that, uh, that type of question versus, hey, Charles, just help me with operating what I'm already doing? Yeah, it, it all again, it all starts with what is it, how does it align to our work? You know, how does it align strategically? So Knight Foundation will fund operations, we will yep. fund multi-year. Uh, and then and then what do we think is going to be the impact on that that investment? What's going to be, you know, the social return? And so that's how we look at it. So there's, you know, uh, you know, it's really an evaluation of the idea or the organization, what they're doing, and then we make a decision whether it'll be a year or multi-year, um, whether it'll be operating, you know, we we fund staff, we fund executive level positions because we feel that entity, those leaders are providing, are, are really advancing our portfolio of work. Uh, and so that's, um, that's how we look at, you know, grant making around uh, operational or uh, multi-year. Love that. And of course you confirm what you said earlier, right? If there's strategic alignment, you're open to, that type of grant making, whether it be operating or multi-year. And that of course gives the organization the flexibility it needs to do what you've already confirmed is mm -hmm. good work. Um, as you look at the landscape, Charles, and you see lots of issues within our communities, within nonprofits in particular, anything in particular concern you? And I guess the follow-up of course is, yeah, what does the Knight Foundation want to do to address some of these biggest challenges you're seeing? Um, so, you know, as I look at the landscape, um, you know, things that, um, you know, we, uh, you know, again, I've kind of said it before is just how disruptive technology can be. Again, if you look at how disruptive technology has been as it relates to journalism and information, um, we're right now, um, you know, uh, we sometimes say, uh, an, um, an infodemic, you know, a misinformation, um, pandemic in the sense that, folks don't know, you know, where do people get trusted information? And I think this is, we're seeing that play out um, as it relates to the pandemic and, and folks getting uh, and making the decisions that would really um, support their health as well as support public health. Right. Uh, I think that um, another uh, issue that's uh, concerned to me personally is, um, you know, uh, uh, creating systemic change um, in particular to advance racial equity. Uh, the, um, you know, the challenges we've faced um, um, from, you know, our history of, um, you know, uh, racism in our country continues to plague us and holds back um, the potential in our society. And so um, constantly looking for ways that we can build a more equitable and inclusive community, which is what's a core value at Knight Foundation is it's about, you know, we say our mission is about informed and engaged, but if you don't have access to the internet, how can you be informed and engaged? Yep. So how do we play a role in, um, in, in ensuring that um, everyone has, you know, access to the information they need, uh, you know, um, whether it's through technology or whether in the West End, when your community is changing rapidly around you, where do you go for information? How do you engage with that? And how can you be at a level with a developer where the power dynamic is maybe not equal, but maybe with your whole community, it becomes equal. Um, and with an understanding of how to, to navigate the levers of government, that there's an 
equal footing for community to 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 request and demand the type of development that really benefits them and serves them. So um, it, equity is embedded in what we do, um, and it's you know I'm excited and um, um, proud of the work that we get to do in the West End that helps us to help um, a Black majority community um, be a part of Charlotte's growth, and we're working hard to make sure they're benefiting from it. Yeah, I'm I'm struck by that term. I had not heard the infodemic, but it makes perfect sense. And I'm delighted to hear you and the Knight Foundation are trying to address that because that is the root of many of our problems, it would seem to me, in our communities. Um, and speaking of racial inequities, something I know you know very well, the larger philanthropic concern about, frankly, the inequitable distribution of philanthropic dollars. And, Absolutely. You know, uh, I, I'm glad to see a heightened awareness of underserved and minority led nonprofits perhaps receiving their fair share. But are we making progress in that area? And how do you and the Knight Foundation look at that topic of inequitable funding? Um, I think in aggregate, we're going to see um, that in the last couple of years, we have a blip of an increase in funding um, in in. in um, Black-led organizations um, and maybe organizations of color. Um, I think we're. I'm. I'm hopeful that the progress is systemic and not um, not a blip. Um, and so, you know, for us, our role in that is to continue to to play in the area that is really um, in our area of strength, which is around you know fostering informed and engaged communities. And so, uh, recently, I was uh, when you asked me that first question of what I'm proud of. Um, you know, we recently um, created a new endowed chair of journalism, night chair of journalism at Howard University, um, which led to um, went from a five million dollar gift to 20 million dollar in gifts when MacArthur Foundation, Ford Foundation and an anonymous donor, um, you know, built upon the five that we gave. And now you have a historically black um, university, Howard University, that's going to have some of the top um, journalism professors in Nicole Hannah-Jones and ta Coates uh, teaching the next generation of black journalists um, in uh, investigative reporting in, in, in a way to help um, build our democracy. So I think it's a really good example of, of thinking about, you know, um, how can we get further up the, you know, up the, up, up the system, if you will, of ensuring that, you know, there are, um, more black journalists in our future and that they're being taught by the best um, journalists in the field. Uh, and that when we begin to unleash those journalists into our community, the questions, the stories that they're right about, you know, we have an issue that it, part of the challenge with the trust that we have, when I talk about mistrust of or misinformation, we have a, a, a huge issue around trust in, in, in news, information, journalism, the government, um, because communities have been excluded. Yep. And so as we help to build more, um, to expand the, the, the pipeline of talent and expand who um, is writing stories and writing narratives, which we think that's not that big a deal, but it's a huge deal in our information society, then we will, you know, begin to help inform um, the wider community about um, what the opportunities are about how to do the systems change that's needed when you talk about policy change and, you know, journalists are a part of the front lines of informing us about what our government is doing and how we can, you know, make decisions that really advance our community. So, uh, so that's something I'm proud of. It's, it's something that concerns me. It's something that we will have to stay vigilant um, with um, and, um, and hopeful and recognize that this is a marathon. Yeah, that's well put. And again, I appreciate your perspective on the next generation, what we're doing, not just with our communities, but the next generations that follow. And in fact, speaking of an investment <laughs> that you have made and in, in personally and professionally with your community partner, Valeta Fullwood, uh, the new generation of African-American philanthropists, you were a co-founder of that um, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I am not a co-founder of New Generation of African-American Philanthropists. That is Valeda Fullwood. Mm -hmm. I am a member. So not she, like, no. She, she was kind to give you credit. As you know, Charles, she was a no wonderful way. guest. 
She did not give me credit for that. <laughs> what what I will take credit for is that Valeda and I are um, are the creators, and maybe I can even be a co-creator of this. I was the photographer for a book called um, "Giving Back: um, a Tribute to um, African American um, Philanthropy and Philanthropists" in uh, the exhibit, "The Soul of Philanthropy." So I will take credit for that, but not. <laughs> oh, All no. right, we will re retain. <laughs> I mean, full credit. I mean, maybe later. put her, bring her on the show. Maybe she'll like, <laughs> then I'll, I'll take the credit from her, but not, no, until I hear it from her. <laughs> uh, we'll have to go back through the show notes of Valeda's appearance on this podcast, okay. but she does indeed give you great credit, but you were part of a group. And I wonder if you could speak to that appropriate, certainly as we are now currently in black philanthropy month, August of 2021, talk about that organization, what it means. And it strikes me again, to your point, of this is the next generation investing even further, but maybe you could speak to more about what NGAP was trying to do and is going to do going forward. Oh, absolutely. Um, so New Generation of African American Philanthropists, or NGAP for short, is a giving circle. Uh, we have, you know, between 30 to 50 members um, at a given time. Uh, we give a dollar a day um, to, um, so $365, and we pool our resources to give out grants locally in Charlotte. Uh, and we've just celebrated our 15-year anniversary. Um, I became a member in 2011. It is um, a wonderful organization that is an opportunity for us to learn about philanthropy and to celebrate Black philanthropy uh, and to uh, to together live, you know, the meaning of philanthropy, which is the love of humankind. Uh, and we do it together. And so you think about a book club, you think about an investment club, that's what it is to be in a, um, a giving circle and, the, and for us to be in, um, in, in gap. And so, uh, out over 15 years, it's been a way for us to, to learn together. We are now also in a stage of, um, of amplifying the stories of Black philanthropy through the books that we've published, the exhibits that we've presented, as well as the civic engagement events that we've held. And then this year, we're taking it to the next level um, with um, um, the release of, uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're doing some research on Black-led um, organizations in Charlotte, and we have um, some really good work that we're looking to share with the community around the data around that, the dirge of uh, funding for Black uh, organization-led organizations in Charlotte. And then we um, annually celebrate Black Philanthropy Month, um, as you mentioned. And uh, last year, uh, we celebrated on the local level, as well as Valeda is one of the co-producers um, um, on the national level. And, um, and we're a funder of that national effort. And what we were able to do last year, even during COVID virtually, um, is we brought 200 um, nonprofit leaders together and connected them to funders. Uh, and we have um, some really innovative ways that we want to continue that going forward. Um, so if, if folks have been listening to this conversation and the number of times I've said digital, um, well, you know, NGAP <laughs> has, some, has some aims to, to really be supportive um, leveraging technology to, to help funders and Black-led nonprofits um, in Charlotte. And our goal is to increase that, that number, um, decrease the amount of funding to Black-led nonprofits uh, and to increase uh, the understanding of those organizations, increase their leadership capacity um, and their social capital, uh, all to advance our country, advance our city, um, to make our city um, a more um, prosperous uh, community. And I think make us more competitive around the world. That's I think the, the inequities that we have, whether it be racial or economic, we're just leaving talent on the table. And if we can do that better than any other country in the world, we will be, you know, we will, we will continue to be um, a strong nation going forward and a leader. Um, and so, don't, I, so anyway, I'll stop. I can continue to talk, but <laughs> it gets me excited to talk about NGAP and Black Philanthropy Month and um, the, the wonderful, our wonderful colleagues, um, uh, a part of that, uh, the giving circle and all the great work we do. We're going to lift it up, Charles. It deserves uh, for everyone, Valeda in particular, you and others that were part of it. In fact, Valeda was episode number 52. So I'm going to recall for our listeners that episode, a great one. And we'll, as things develop, Charles, we'll include that in your sh episode show notes as well as hers. And hopefully we can play a small part in lifting up 
Black Philanthropy Month as it expands nationally, and if not internationally, right, that's significant. What you all are doing here in Charlotte, I think you're seeing replicated across the country, right? Uh, we are. We um, we actually have um, uh, a group that is forming in Charleston uh, that we're helping to form, and we are constantly getting um, calls to speak and to support other giving circles and in, in other other parts of the country. That's fantastic. Last question, Charles. You have wonderful advice for our nonprofit listeners, those that are current leaders of nonprofit organizations or those that want to be. You've been down that path. I wonder any other final advice you'd offer to someone that comes to you and says, hey, I'm thinking about nonprofit leadership. What would you tell them? Um, well, a couple of things is um, make sure. Sh- uh, <laughs> Uh, one balance is critical. So just watch, be careful of, of burnout, be careful of being so caught up in solving that problem. Uh, two, it's a marathon. This is something I'd learned at night. I thought I was going to come in here and, you know, with, with what I thought was a lot of money, um, changed all of Charlotte. And I quickly had to slow it down and get strategic and get really focused on what I can do. Understanding our spheres of influence is so critical to, to maintaining that balance. So, those are just a few, few thoughts. That's fantastic. And like other comments you have shared, the advice is very helpful. I know for our nonprofit colleagues listening and Charles, if I can ask you for one parting gift, in addition to all that you've shared that we will put in the show notes, how about a book that has been meaningful to you on your professional journey that you might recommend for our listeners? Sure. I've got a couple of books. Um, the most recent book that I, I read is how to be an anti-racist. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think that's critical if we're going to really be in a, in a, in a, in, and create a more inclusive and equitable society, understanding what racism means and how to be anti-racist. And then the second book is, um, switch, um, uh, which is a really good book about designing for social change. Um, and it's been really helpful to think innovatively about solving community issues. Fantastic. Two good ones to add to the collection of wonderful recommendations. Everybody needs some summer reading right now, Charles. So you've given them two more to add to their list. Uh, where can people find out more about you and the great work you're doing through the Knight Foundation? Sure. You can um, follow me on Twitter and Instagram um, at C Thomas CLT. Um, and you can also learn more about Knight Foundation at www kf.org or knightfoundation.org. Uh, and, um, and I'm always happy to uh, hear from folks. Feel, feel free to uh, message me or email me. Charles, thanks for sharing your wisdom. And thank you again for joining me on the path. Thank you so much, Pat. And it's a pleasure to reconnect. Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Charles as much as I did and came away with some practical ideas that can guide your leadership journey in the nonprofit sector and perhaps enhance that next conversation you have with a funder that will allow you to utilize some of the words of wisdom you heard from Charles. Don't forget about the show notes. They are available on our website, PattonMcDowell.com. It's episode number 118. You can find out more about Charles and the great work the Knight Foundation is doing locally here in the Charlotte region and all across the United States. As always, please share this episode with someone else on the path. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. You can go to the podcast page again at PattonMcDowell.com and you'll see links to all of the primary podcast platforms. Don't miss out on any of these weekly episodes. They come out every Thursday as well as bonus features we're producing at least once a month. Once again, if you like this episode, you need to check out Charles' partner, Valeta Fullwood. She had a wonderful appearance on the podcast. It was episode number 52, so check that out and learn more about Valeta and the great work she's doing. Thanks, as always, for what you are doing in the nonprofit sector, especially right now, and keep up the good work for causes that are most meaningful to you. I'll keep bringing you content that can help you do it even better. Have a great week. I'll see you next time on The Path.